Sometimes this world makes no sense to me. I'm torn between what others want and what is me. It seems a song is what the world demands, but how can I sing in this strange land? Until I die, I'll sing God's song, living in this Babylon, always looking for the shore of the world that I was made for. The world where the weak are finally strong and the righteous are known for righting wrongs. I want to see this earth start shaking, being impacted by a powerful generation that is finally waking up inside. And on the final day when I die, I want to hold my head up high. I want to look God himself in the eye and tell him that I tried. You know, what a perfect song for studying the book of Daniel. If you have your Bibles, I want you to turn to Daniel. We're going to be in chapter 2 today. And as you're turning, I just really feel led to take a time to pray. I know there are many of you who are going through some difficult times, many of you who uh, just really would say, I just need God to, to intervene into my life and to show me that He's real. Uh, just yesterday we had uh, Steve Roof, I don't know if any of you heard about this, but he attempted to cut his leg off with a chainsaw. And uh, so he's at home today, give a shout out to him as he and Debbie are at home taking care of his leg. Uh, this last week, Lynn Burton and, and uh, Connie Burton, one of their dearest friends up in Richmond, Virginia, uh, they found his wife had passed away. And so they're up there in Richmond. Gene Huckabee's very sick. And uh, we just need to pray for him. There's so many things going on in, in the lives of people in our church. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to bow your heads. And I want us to pray together this morning, those things that I mentioned. But if you would just say, Pastor, I have a prayer request this morning. Would you just remember me? Would you raise your hand? Yeah, all over the room. All over the room. Let's pray together. Lord, do you see every hand you know every heart and you know every need and you are a God who meets us at the point of our need and so right now Father I ask for you to, to minister to each one who just raised their hand each one who just with a simple lifted hand are crying out to you and saying God I need you to be God in my life. And Lord, I, I pray for, for us that as your hands and your feet and your voice that, Lord, you'd raise us up to help meet the need. Help us to be Jesus with flesh. To love and to care and to, to share the hope that's within us. Father, for those that need a, a healing touch of just in their hearts, their emotions, I pray, Father, that you would be there. For those who need a physical touch, like Gene Huckabee and, and like Steve Roof, like my son, Colin. Lord, would you just reach down from heaven and touch them? Whether you use doctors, nurses, or just, Father, your Jehovah Rapha, that, Lord, that you would meet us and heal us. Lord, we commit this time to you. We commit each one, one another to you. And we ask, Father, that you would be sufficient. And we thank you for this in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Let me ask you a question. You ever felt like you've been in a no-win situation? I, I, I've been there a couple times. I remember one time in particular, I was in high school and I was a wrestler and that day, I, I was wrestling, my natural body weight at that time was probably about 160 pounds, and I was wrestling 155. So every week, I would have to drop weight, and then I would just eat something, and immediately I'd go back to 160 pounds. And all week, I would lose weight to start back. Well, one Friday morning, I woke up, and I was three pounds overweight. I needed to get to 155. I was 158. I had to get to 155 by 6 o'clock that night. Yes. And to make matters worse, if I didn't make the weight, I would, my, my team would be miffed. I was actually a, a decent wrestler. My team would be mad. 
and my coach would be ticked. But to make matters worse, if I made weight, I was going to have to wrestle a monster. And who was the defending state champion in his weight class? I mean, this guy's arms were like this. I mean, he was massive. So I didn't have a lot of incentive to lose the weight, except to know that if I didn't lose the weight, I was probably going to be run to death by my coach. So all day, I, I don't recommend this, but all day in between classes at lunch, I ran in the showers them all, all on hot with a plastic bag around me. Yeah, that's, that's a recipe for disaster, isn't it? Anyway, so I get, we, finally, we get on the bus, we go to the school, we're supposed to wrestle, and I'm still doing everything I can to lose the weight. And I'm so weak that when I get up on the scales, the scales are bouncing. But because of who I'm wrestling and because the other coach knows that this guy's incredible, he says, I'll let him go ahead and wrestle. So they let me through. So my coach isn't going to be ticked off, but now I've got to wrestle a monster. A no-win situation. We'll finish the rest of that story later. In Daniel chapter 2, we find Daniel and his friends in a no-win situation. See, what has happened is that Nebuchadnezzar has had a dream. A dream he once interpreted. By the way, we're not going to talk about the dream today. We'll do that in the fall when we come back and talk about Daniel and all the prophecies. We're going to do that starting in August. So today, we're not going to look at the dream, but we are going to look at Daniel. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar's had this dream that he can't understand. He's anxious to understand it, burdened to understand it. And so what he does, he calls in all the enchanters, all the sorcerers, all the people that are supposed to be the wise guys. And he says to them, here's what I want you to do. I want you not only to interpret the dream, I want you to tell me what the dream was. And here's the kicker. If you tell me the dream and interpret it for me, I'm going to make you wealthy beyond your imagination. You're going to have so much fame and so much fortune, you, you won't know how to handle it. But if you don't tell me the dream and if you don't interpret it for me, I'm going to cut you into little pieces. And then I'm going to go and turn your house into rubble. Sounds like a great, great alternative. Tell the dream, interpret it. House into rubble, cut into pieces. It's kind of like what I felt. Face my coach, face a monster. No win situation. It would be like me telling you I had a dream, and if you could tell me the dream, I'm going to bless you beyond what you can imagine. But if you don't, well, you're all going to die. Great alternative. Last week, we started a series in the book of Daniel. We call, we're calling it Unbowed. And the reason we're called unbound is because it's about how do we live in a culture that's turned upside down and inside out? How do we honor God when everything around us is dishonoring God? How do we have a heart that's fixed on Him? How do we stand for truth when everyone's falling for lies? How do we go against the flow? When I, when I go against the flow, it reminds me of a t-shirt I had when I was in high school. I wore this when I was a, a high school student. You may have seen this. Go against the flow. The little ichthus going the other direction. But notice the verse at the bottom. Do not be conformed to this world. Paul says in Romans, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove that good and acceptable holy word of God. So Paul is reiterating really what, De what Daniel was living. He's saying, I'm not going to be stuffed into the pattern of this world. I'm going to be conformed to Christ, not to the world. In other words, I'm not going to live bowed down to the world. I'm going to live unbowed. I'm going to live unmistakably for Christ. And that's what this entire series is about. And so as, as chapter 2 opens, we're going to find this dream that's being discussed, and, and we're going to see how Daniel handles himself. So if you have your Bibles, I want you to follow along. We're going to start in verse 1 of chapter 2. In the second year of his reign, Nebuchadnezzar had a dream, or had dreams. He had a reoccurring dream. His mom was troubled, and he couldn't sleep. So the king summoned the magician, enchanters, sorcerers, and astrologers to tell him what he had dreamed. When they stood before the king, they said to, he said to them, I have had a dream that troubles me, and I want to know what it means. 
The astrologers replied to the king, May the king live forever. Tell your servants the dream and we'll interpret it. The king replied, This is what I have firmly decided. If you don't tell me what my dream was and interpret it, I'll have you cut into pieces and your house is turned into rubble. But if you tell me the dream and explain it, you'll receive from me gifts, rewards, and great honor. Tell me the dream and interpret it for me. They again replied, let the king tell his servants the dream and we'll interpret it. Apparently, the, the people were hard of hearing back then as well. The king said, I'm certain you're trying to gain time because you realize this is what I have firmly decided. If you do not tell me the dream, here's, there's only one penalty for you. You've conspired to tell me misleading and wicked things, hoping the situation will change. So then, tell me the dream, and I'll know that you can interpret it for me. Talk about being between a rock and a hard place. That's where these guys are. These men of the dark arts have a problem. Got to remember, Babylon, pagans, they were under the influence of Satan. Certainly there were times because of Satan's influence, because of demonic influences, they were able to pull off some stunts. But if you remember last week, why are the Israelites in Babylon? Because God is at work. So the circumstance that they're in right now is all done by the initiative of God. And so these men of the dark arts have no power. And so they're, 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 in, a, they're in a difficult situation. So all they can do is beg the king to say, hey, tell us the dream. Then we can interpret it for you. You know what? Every one of you could come up here and tell me a dream right now. And I could interpret it for you. It may not be right, but I could give you something. And that's what Nebuchadnezzar understood. So Nebuchadnezzar says, I don't think so. You've got to tell me the dream and you've got to interpret it for me. See, what happened was Nebuchadnezzar, in all likelihood, inherited all of his dad's wise guys. And he didn't trust them. So this opportunity gave him a chance to kind of separate the men from the boys. The guys who really had these skills and the guys who didn't. And what he found out was none of them had it. None of them. And so here's what they say. The astrologers answered, there's no one on earth who can do what the king asked. No king, however, great and mighty, has asked such a thing of any magician or enchanter or astrologer. What the king asked is too difficult. Now here's what they did get right. No one can reveal it to the king except the gods. In this particular case, except God. And they don't live among humans. And so what does he do? Nebuchadnezzar, he calls his chief executioner together and says, all right, go out, find all the wise guys, find all the enchanters, all the sorcerers. It doesn't matter if they've come from Jerusalem. It doesn't matter if, they, if they're Babylonian. I want you to extinguish them all, exterminate them. Well, what happens? When Daniel finds out about this, because Daniel wasn't in the first group that got brought. He and his buddies have just finished their three years of education. If you remember back in chapter 1, when they got pulled from Jerusalem into Babylon, he took these 12 to 15-year-olds and he put them in school. He was trying to indoctrinate them. Nebuchadnezzar was trying to, to turn their hearts and basically change who they were. So if you remember, he changed their diet, he changed their names, and he changed their education. Gave them a, they, he basically indoctrinated them into history and to the culture of Babylon. Well, the, apparently they've just now finished these three years. And so they come in and they say, Daniel comes up and says, now listen. He goes to the chief executioner and says, I didn't have a chance to hear what the king said. I would like to, have, I would like to, to be able to go see the king. Now how old is Daniel here? Somewhere between the ages of 15 and 18 years of age. And yet, he's got these skills, these qualities. In fact, in the chapter 1, Nebuchadnezzar, when he met Daniel the first time, said, I've not met anyone who has the skills these guys, these guys have. And this is when they were 12 to 15 years of age. He says, they have 10 times the wisdom of anyone I've ever met. And so Daniel says, I'd like to see Nebuchadnezzar. And Arioch says, I'll make that happen. Now, before we jump into this, I want to tell you that, uh, I, want, I want us today to look at what caused 
Daniel to stand out so much among the Babylonians. Last week, we focused on what it meant to stay true. We looked at that how we are to, when we experience change, that we are to, 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 to learn to trust. And we, when we're forced with comp- or faced with compromise, that we have to learn to hold promise. Today, we're going to talk about what it means to stand out and the types of character or the types of skills necessary to do that. And so the first thing I want you to see in Daniel's life is that he had a a, a consistent, uncompromising character. A consistent, uncompromising character. If we're going to stand out for God in this world, we have to have a consistent, uncompromising character. I love what George Washington said. I thought this was really great. He says, few men have the virtue to withstand the highest bidder. Few men have the the virtue to withstand the highest bender. I think our first president was right. Most people have a price. In fact, if you look around, most people, they give themselves to pennies on the dollar. They will sell themselves out for anything, anything. I was reading an article this week that talked about what people would be willing to do for a million dollars and what they'd be willing to do for five million dollars. So I thought I'd have a little fun with you. How many of you, for $1 million, would eat a cockroach every day for the rest of your life? Anybody? (laughs) Yes, we have one. 25% of people said they would eat a a live cockroach every day for the rest of their life for $1 million. Yeah. Oh, it gets worse. How many of you would, would, would spend five years in a maximum security prison in general population for a million dollars. <laughs> it's the same family. <laughs> 30% of people said they would do that. 30%. Now, here's one that uh, uh, this will go over really well in the, in the next service with all of our teenagers. How many of you would give up your, give up your cell phone and your internet for 15 years for a million dollars? Yeah, I, f- I figured as much. According to the statistics, 45% of people would do that. It was obviously not talking about millennials and below, all right? How many of you, this, this, was, this, is, this is terrifying. In fact, I'm going to set it up differently. Listen to this. How many of you would not bathe or use deodorant ever again for a million dollars? Get a load of this. I'm, I'm setting you up. 7% of people said they would do that. Of course, my son, who's a middle schooler, said he would do it. Seven percent. Now, let me show you the difference. Let me show you how scary our culture is. How many of you would take money, it, it, take money knowing that every time you took it, some random person in the world would die? You ready for this? How many people said they would not use deodorant? Seven percent. Fifty percent of people surveyed said they would let someone die for them to get money. What does that tell you about our culture? How many of you would live alone on an island for three years for a million dollars? (laughs) Anything to get away from him. Anything. (laughs) Here's the last two. These are I thought were interesting too. How many of you would would divorce your spouse for a million dollars? 47% of people said they would. 47%. Can't imagine. Here's the last one. How many of you for a million dollars, for a million dollars, how many of you would give up 10 years of your life? 32% of people surveyed said they would give up 10 years of their life for a million dollars. What does that tell us? It tells us that far too many people have a price tag on what they will and will not do. Here's here's what Daniel teaches us. Daniel teaches us that he wasn't about to defile himself for anyone or anything. That his faith in God and his commitment to God was not for sale. Weren't for sale. If we are going to stand out in our world, our faith and our convictions and and the living out of our faith cannot be for sale. Can't be for sale. 
And what he teaches us is that our credibility, our integrity, our faith is the most valuable thing that we have. Who we are and whose we are can never be for sale, ever. But he wasn't just someone who said, I have a conviction that my character matters. He was someone who lived it out. He was an an above and beyond kind of guy. He didn't ever just settle. Uh, This last week or two weeks ago when I was at a conference down in Orlando, uh, this one guy who spoke, he, he made this comment. I thought, that's interesting. He said, there are three types of people in the world. Those who do enough to get by, they just do enough. Those who do what's expected and those who excel above and beyond. And the simple question is, which one are you? Are you a person who just does enough? A person who does what's expected? Or a person who always goes above and beyond? What Daniel shows us is that as children of God, we should always be the people who go above and beyond. We should excel. Let me give you a verse for that. Colossians 3.17. In everything you do, in word and in deed, do it to the glory of God. Do it to the glory of God. Always give it your best. And because of that, the Babylonians saw this in Daniel. They saw integrity. I, I can only imagine that in Babylonian culture, as pagan as it was, integrity was something that when they saw it, they were like, whoa, what's that? You know what happens in our culture today when someone actually has integrity? We step back and go, what's that? Because we live in a culture that integrity has been lost. What is integrity? Integrity is who you are when no one else is looking. Integrity is who you are when everyone is looking. Integrity is who you are when your life gets squeezed. That's what integrity is. And why is this important? Because if Daniel had not had integrity, Arioch would have never listened to him. He'd have cut him to pieces. And, and, and if, he was, if he didn't have integrity, even if, if, if Arioch gave him, he would have never seen Nebuchadnezzar. But instead, because of that, Nebuchadnezzar gave him an audience because he saw in Daniel something that was so unique so different from the rest of the culture that he trusted it. And I can promise you this, when we have integrity, when we have uncompromising character, we stand out. People notice. Listen to what happens. Go down around verse 13. It says, the decree was issued to put the wise men to death and men were sent to look for Daniel and his friends to put them to death. When Arioch, the commander of the king's guard, had gone out and put, de- put to death the wise men of Babylon, Daniel spoke to him with wisdom and tact. Daniel asked, what did the king issue? Why did the king issue such a harsh decree? And Arioch explained the matter to Daniel. At this, Daniel went into the king and asked for time that he might interpret the dream for him. It was because of who Daniel was, because of who God was in Daniel's life. Don't miss that. It's because of who Daniel was, because of God in his life, that he was respected by the Babylonians. They knew him by his reputation. And so because of that, God put Daniel in a place of honor. And God gave him opportunities. And can I tell you this? I, 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 can, I can promise you this. If you are a person of uncompromising conviction, excuse me, uncompromising character, and you follow God, God will put you in places and opportunities that you cannot begin to fathom that will make a difference for his kingdom and his glory. I promise you that. That's the first quality. Second quality is that he was a man of composed, unshakable courage. You know, courage is something that's been lost in our society. There are, there are men and women of courage. We see them in the police department. We see them in the fire department. We see them in the military. But it's amazing how many wimps and wusses are out in our culture today. I, I better get back to the text. I might say some things I, I shouldn't say. 
Look at the situation. Daniel is faced with death. It says that they came out. Look back, look back at this verse. The decree was issued to put the wise men to death, and men were sent to look for Daniel. They were sent to find him to do what? To put him in prison? No. To give, to give him a, a vacation? No. To execute him, to exterminate him and his buddies. And yet, what does he do? When he finds out this is happening, does he sit back? Does he hide? Does he run for cover? No. He goes and finds the chief executioner and says, hey, I want to talk to you. Great lesson here, folks. Great lesson. We don't run from problems. We run to problems. If you run from your problems, it might end up costing you your life. But we run to problems in order to solve them. And so Daniel sets out to find the chief executioner and have a conversation with him. And he says, listen, I'd just like to have an audience with the king. And because of who he was, because of what he has done, Ariok says, I'll do it. Now, lest we forget, how old is Daniel here? Somewhere between 15 and 18 years of age. Wise beyond his years. But also notice how he does it. He does it with wisdom. He does it with humility. He does it with tact. And so when we confront a problem, it's not going there like a, like a bull in a china shop. It's to approach people with wisdom and humility and tact. What's the phrase? You always catch more bees with honey. And yet we look at our society, it just blows me away how when there's a problem, we go in with, with guns blazing and we don't care who gets hit. It's just the opposite of how Daniel approached it. Just the opposite. So if we're going to have composed courage, unshakable courage, there are three things we have to learn. We have to run, learn to run to and not from our problems run to and not from our problems. We also, secondly, we have to confront trouble with wisdom, humility, and tact. And three, we have to trust in the Lord alone for his guidance and his provision. That's what he teaches us. That's what he shows us. We steward the gifts and abilities God gives us. We trust him and we allow God to direct our steps. So the second thing, the first thing is, we have consistent, uncompromising character. The second thing Daniel shows us is we have composed, unshakable courage. And then the third thing, and this is the best part. This is the part I love. This is the part I've been wanting to get to. We have, we have captivated, unfailing conviction. Why does God shower his grace on Daniel? Because Daniel's heart, Daniel's life is completely committed to God. He said, I'm not going to defile myself. I'd rather die than defile myself. I, I, I will do anything in order to keep my relationship with God clean and pure and right. Look what it says. Daniel doubles down. After the king says, all right, you can go home. It says, Daniel returned to his house and explained the matter to his friends, Hananiah, Mishael, Mishael and Azariah, or as you may know them later, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He urged them to plead for mercy from God, from the God of heaven concerning this mystery. So he and his friends might not be executed with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. During the night, the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a vision. Daniel praised the God of, of heaven and said, praise be the name of God forever and ever. Wisdom, power are his he changes times and season. He deposes kings and raises up others. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to the discerning. He reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what lies in darkness and, and light dwells within him. I thank and praise you, God of my ancestors. You have given me wisdom and power. You have made known to me what we ask of you. You have made known to us the dream of the king. If you remember, last week we talked about what is the theme of the book of Daniel. And the theme is very simple. There is a God in heaven and he is in control. 
There is a God in heaven and he is in control. And because he's in control, he can be trusted. He can be trusted in every single detail of our lives, even when we, even when we don't understand it. Because I can promise you the Israelites were trying to say, God, why did you let Babylon destroy us and take us into captivity? It was all part of God's plan. It was all what God was doing to turn their hearts back to him. And so what we see here is that Daniel, he and his friends, he goes back and he says, listen, guys, we have to pray. We need God to show up and act like God. God has opened a door for us. Instead of us being executed, God has opened a door for him to do great things through our lives. So let's seek him. And I love this. Daniel goes back, invites his buddies to join him in seeking God's will. One of the most important things you and I can do when we're faced with a no-win situation, when we're faced just with life, is go to the people we know who go to God and say, hey, would you join me in praying about these things? Will you join me in asking God to speak clearly to guide our steps? Can I tell you what most of us do? We go to our friends and we tell them how clever we were in handling the situation. Oh, you should have seen it. Man, I, I, Arioch came to me and here's what I did. Here's what I told Arioch and he bought it and he got me in front of Nebuchadnezzar. And as I stood before Nebuchadnezzar, I said, Nebuchadnezzar, I said, Nebi, let me show you what I can do for you. That's what we do. Let's just be honest. We handle it in our own abilities. We say, I, I, I've got it all figured out. And we leave the Lord out and we trust in our abilities, our ingenuity, instead of, instead of giving credit where credit is due. What do we do? We take the credit and we like it when people pat ourselves on the back. And some of us, if someone, won't, someone else won't pat us, we'll reach back there and pat ourselves. That's what we see. That's what we do. But instead, we're to seek the Lord. We're not to seek advice from self-help books. We're not to seek advice from some talk show host, which God knows 90% of our culture does. We're to seek the Lord's will. We're to seek his counsel through his words. We're not to take a straw poll. We're not to do the pros and cons. We're to seek the Lord. See, people who stand out fall down. People who stand out fall down to their knees and they say, God, I can't do this without you. God, I need you to show up and be God. God, I need you to order my steps. God, I need you to be faithful to your promise that when I trust you with all my heart and lean not on my own understanding, but in all of my ways acknowledge you, that you will direct my steps. I have to, I have to ask God for you to do that. I cannot seek a way that seems right to myself. Someone said it this way, instead of sending out an email, we need to get, to eat, to get an email. I love this. I read this quote this week and I thought, man, that's so perfect. It's so applicable. Listen to this. Faith is living by trust alone without scheming. Faith is living by, by, by trust alone without scheming. It's not you and I going, okay, we do this, we do this, we can do this, we do this, 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 this. Can I tell you what most of us do? We'll say, oh, but God gave me a brain. Yes, he did. He gave you a brain so you'd be smart enough to realize that you can't do it without him. That's the reason he gave you a brain. He didn't give you a brain so you could say, I'm going to do this, 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 and this. Oh, God, will you bless this plan? He gave us a brain so we'd say, you know what? If I do this, 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 and this, I'm going to get man's results. But if I want God's results, then I have to bend my knee and I have to bow my heart and I have to say, God, would you guide me? Lord, would you help me not to trust in human ingenuity and human ability? But Lord, here are my abilities. Here is my mind. Here is my heart. And I give it to you. And I ask you to direct my steps. Listen to this. This may be the most important statement of this entire message. The degree of our dependency on God 
is revealed by how quickly we turn to him in prayer and how patient we are to wait for his answer. I'm going to say that again. The degree of our dependency on God is revealed by how quickly we turn to him in prayer and how patient we are to wait for his answers. See, it's one thing for us to go, God, I need you. And we bow down and we say, God, guide me. But then we get up and we do our own thing. That's not praying. Praying is when we get on our knees, God direct, and we wait for him to answer. Then we get up and under the leading of the Holy Spirit, in accordance with the word of God and the will of God, we put into practice what he's told us to do. That's the Christian life. That's the call. Well, very quickly, let's do this. Turn your Bibles over to Philippians chapter 4. I want to show you a passage of Scripture to close out that I think is, is very applicable here in this situation. Philippians chapter 4, verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord always, and I'll say it again. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. So do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, in everything, by prayer and supplication, prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, I want you to underline that phrase, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, watch what it'll do. It'll guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. It'll guard your hearts and minds. The phrase rejoice means to Return to the source of your joy. Run to it. And this is exactly what Daniel did. Daniel, when, when, when the king came to him and said, hey, listen, I'm going to give you a shot. I'm going to let you have the time you need. Daniel ran to his friends and said, we've got to go to God. And they returned to the source of their joy. They returned to the only one who had a solution to their problem. And then it says, do not be anxious for anything. Are you anxious about anything today? Is there something in your life that has your heart and your mind preoccupied? God says, stop scheming about it and bring it to me. And if you bring it to me, I'm going to give you a peace about it. I may not give you the answer you want. I may not give you, I may not, I may hold back and, and say it's not time for the answer. But what I will do is I'll give you my peace. Now, I know this is hard. I, I, I know that it, it seems counterintuitive. But the right way to handle the details and the distraction of our lives is not to try to figure it out ourselves. It is to go to God and say, God, I need you. I need your direction. I need your wisdom. I need your understanding. And let me tell you why. You may not understand this. You may not have known this. But you and I, from the very beginning, were wired to live dependently on God. We were wired that way. And that's one reason we go back to, you shall have another gods before me, because God says, I wired you to seek God me, to desire me. But what happens if we, if we pull back from God, we find some other little G God to try to be the, the, the person who provides the solutions to our lives. We're wired to live dependently. And this requires that we trust God instead of trust our own schemes or the schemes of man. By the way, it's vital that we all recognize that God doesn't promise A quick, concise answer. I'll give you this for free. Ready for this? God's going to answer your prayers in one of three ways. Yes, no, wait. Yes, no, wait. Yes, I will give this to you because you need it and you need it now. Wait, or or no, I'm not going to do that because that's not according to my plan or my will. It's It's not my best for you. And wait. It's not time yet. It's not time yet. But here's what I will promise you. Here's what I've discovered 
in my 52 years of life, God's always on time with the answer. He's not a minute too soon. He's not a moment too late. He's always on time. Just like he was for Daniel. When they needed a vision, when they needed understanding, God said, Daniel, here's the answer. And I truly believe with all my heart, not because of what happens just in Scripture, but what what was happening in my life, is that God, when I seek Him, when I depend on Him, when I trust Him, when I have an unfailing conviction and dependence on Him, He's never a minute too soon or a moment too late. So what is it we need? Very simply this. If we're going to be people who stand out for God, We need to have consistent, uncompromising character. We need to have composed, unshakable courage. And we need to have captivated, unfailing conviction. That will allow you to stand out among all the other people who you know and are associated with. So back to my wrestling story. So I get out, I face this monster And by some miracle, he makes a mistake. And I flip him over, and I get three points for a near fall. Because I'm so weak, he literally just picks me up and throws me about three feet from him. We continue to wrestle, and at the very end of the match, I'm up by four points, and he starts to turn me over, and time runs out, and I won. Sometimes when it looks like you're between a rock and a hard place, sometimes when it looks like you're in a no-win situation, you're right where God wants you so that he can show up and be God in your life. Amen? Father, we are so grateful that you are present, that you love us, that you know every detail about our lives and, and what you desire is for our complete and utter dependence on you. Lord, we thank you for what Daniel taught us, that we need to have, that we need to be people of character, that we need to be people of courage. But Lord, that all begins with being people of conviction. And Lord, my prayer today is there's one person who's never experienced you as their savior. They've never had you tap on the door of their heart to explain to them how much you love them and how you died on the cross to pay for their sin. Lord, my prayer today is that their heart would be open and they would recognize that you are speaking to them, convicting them, inviting them to know you as their Savior. And Lord, if if that's happening right now, I pray that that individual or those individuals in this room would recognize that that's you, that you are, and you're inviting them to to a love relationship. You're inviting them to have their sins forgiven and and to have eternal life with you. And Lord, their response has to be one of faith. Not schemes, but faith. That they would simply say, God, I surrender to you. And today I invite you into into my life to be my Savior and Lord. Lord, for those of us in this room that maybe we have compromised our convictions, Maybe our character has has gone through a difficult process. We've even drug it through the mud. But Lord, with you, when we turn and trust you, when we confess our sin, knowing you're faithful to forgive us and cleanse us, that Lord, you can take that which is filthy and make it whiter than snow. That Lord, you can change not just our present, you can change tomorrow and the next day. And so, Lord, I pray that if there's any of us today that you were sitting here and we know you as our Savior, but we know that we have not had the character and the courage and the conviction that we need, that, Lord, today we would come back and we would turn our eyes upon Jesus. Lord, there are people in this church that need to join. They've been visiting, attending, but, Lord, you've been calling them to be part of this church family. Today we invite them to come. We just give this time to you, Father, in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Let's stand together as we go into our invitation. However God's leading you this morning, I'll be down front. I would love to, to, to talk with you about what God's doing in your life. But let me invite you to come.